Hello, Louisa Jewell here. We are excited to be hosting the first Human Centered Work Summit on January 23rd at the University of Toronto. Links below to get more information. And in our lead up, we wanted to have interesting interviews with people who are doing things to make a difference in the workplace, to create more human-centered approaches in the workplace. And so today, I am just delighted to have Elaine Cook with me today. She is the Manager of Humanistic Education and Training at Holland Bleurview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital here in Toronto, Canada. So welcome, Elaine. It's so great to have you here. It's great to be here, Louisa. Well, thank you so much. Can you share, I know you have created such an interesting and evidence-based and a very thorough and comprehensive approach and training program uh, for your healthcare workers. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, I would love to. We have, uh, over the past five or six years that I've been at Holland Bloorview, first of all, I guess what we're most renowned for is our, our certification program. And that is a year-long program um, that clinicians, and not uniquely clinicians, we invite parents, family leaders, uh, we invite youth and young adults with disabilities, who are clients at the hospital. Anyone who's affiliated with the hospital uh, can join this program. And we even allow people from external uh, organizations to join our program. Um, and it's a year long program where they learn coaching. They learn how to communicate using a solution focused communication model. However, it's unique in that we, we base that model on a humanistic worldview, which is really what it means to be human, not only at work, but fully human in our lives. And so it's fundamental to our program, what we're doing um, really on a daily basis. So it's exciting that you, to be able to have this conversation with you. So, so what does it mean to be human at work, Elaine. Yeah, and I think it's going to look different. What that means is, is it's subjective, of course. And in healthcare, though, I think it has a really profound implication when we think about what it means to be human at work, because we maybe erroneously <laughs> believe that you know, there's probably no other domain outside of healthcare where we really expect that that humanity to show up for people because it's about nurturing and caring and healing. And yet what has happened over decades and decades and decades, both we hear this both in research and anecdotally, that healthcare has become transactional. And what we've what's happened is that we're missing, we're now missing that humanity. And now there's conversations about, you know, healthcare being delivered by AI, which is the antithesis yeah. of what we're saying is necessary to reform healthcare. So I think for us, what that means is and, and, you know, I pulled my my team, I sent them a note earlier this week, and I asked everybody, what does it mean? I love for, that. Yeah. yeah. What does it mean to be human at work to you? And everyone, you know, sent their emails back to me. And perhaps not surprisingly, uh, there were a few really common themes. And our facilitator said, and who are also clinicians, practicing frontline clinicians. So they do both. They facilitate and they have their, their job serving clients and families. And they said it, it's this ability to show up, this ability to bring our whole self to the workplace with a sense of generosity and compassion to understand 
of course, that in any particular moment or context, the people we're working with, the people we're serving, may not be in a position where they can bring their best selves or their whole selves to that appointment or to that engagement. And so that, re that, that requires us to kind of dig deeper, to really look for that sense of humanity and to know that we, despite whatever appearances um, may be present, we have so much more in common with the people that we serve and the people that we're working with than might otherwise be apparent. Yes. Oh, I I really love this recognition of where people are at and mm -hmm. that it because I think sometimes we take it personally when people are offensive or or mean or not behaving in ways. But if you can meet people where they're at and have this compassionate view of the patient that you're dealing with or the coworker that you're dealing with, um, you you can absorb so much more. You're you're not engaging in these difficult emotions, but I think compassion can be such a bridge for good mm -hmm. relationships. I think it's the most important bridge. And in fact, we have a workshop entitled Compassion Versus Empathy that we teach to clinicians because, you know, the narratives and the discourses that are really present in the public space these days about healthcare are pretty negative, right? We keep hearing as healthcare providers, the system is broken. It's about burnout. It's about stress. It's about limited resources. That the narratives, and those are narratives we know affect how pe people's emotions, their thoughts and their behaviors. So you can imagine healthcare workers have a particularly challenging job to be buoyant, <laughs> yeah. I would say, despite um, the circumstances in which they find themselves or, or working with the clients who are really sometimes dealing with catastrophic uh, yes. personal situations. So really helping, you know, the human, the humanity that we bring to those situations can make all the difference in the world. And so we really, when we're working with clinicians, what we do is really help them to identify those compassion pathways, um, as opposed to falling down that pathway of empathetic distress, which <laughs> people often erroneously call compassion fatigue, because we know in neuroscience, there's actually no such thing as compassion fatigue. Compassion doesn't fatigue. It uses neural pathways of motivation and affiliation. What that is, is empathetic distress. And that is a real problem for healthcare providers. So, so working with them in ways that allow them to stay on those compassion pathways can trans excuse me, transform their work experiences. I, I, I've had conversations with people before where they say it's not compassion fatigue, it's empathy fatigue. When we do take on too much of other people's emotions. And so, Elaine, are you, are you suggesting that compassion is different than empathy in, 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 in what ways ah, that are that's helpful? A in what yeah, ways that's, yeah. Yeah, that is such a good question. So it's so interesting because, again, words matter. And that's one of the things we, we teach um, over and over again. Our language matters. Steve DeShazer said, language is not neutral. And we know that now because we can actually see in scans how single words will activate areas of uh, uh, an individual's brain. And so... Compassion and empathy arise from one neural pathway, and they arise from the empathy pathway. As soon as that emotion starts to show itself, you recognize it, it actually, there's an opportunity there to, to switch our focus, to do this. However, without that understanding, without 
knowing how to attend to compassion instead of empathy. Empathy always, 99% of the time, will turn into empathetic distress. That leads to burnout, stress, anxiety, even depression. So it's important that we teach people how to recognize and to stay on that compassion pathway. And there's a wonderful kind of analogy that, that we often use. And it's this, that suppose you had the good fortune of hiking in Moab, you know, you're crawling in and out of canyons and it's this amazing, fantastic hike. And you come across somebody who's trapped under a boulder. Oh, what we say is empathy means that you're going to crawl under the boulder with them. Compassion says you're going to go get help. Oh, and, and you can see how that is so much more energizing throughout the day to manage your energy in that, in that energy of compassion rather than crawling under the boulder. I love that analogy. I think that's a great, that's a great way to put it. Yes. So, so this, I this is just such a great insight. Um, thank mm -hmm. you so much for sharing that tip. And thank you for also sharing how we can be more human at work by engaging that compassion and, and not feeling that we always have to fall under the boulder to make That's it happen. Right. <laughs> well, right. thank, thank you, Elaine. Thank you so much for this wonderful insight today. I really appreciate it. And uh, I, I hope that everyone listening will join us at our Human Centered Work Summit coming up on January the 23rd, uh, 2025 in at the University of Toronto. And thanks again to Elaine. Thank you, Louisa. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.